Um, but thank Ooh. you for calling, and uh, looking forward to seeing you this coming Tuesday over here at the Hanover Theater here in Excellent. Worcester. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I look forward to my visit there, yes. Um, an astrophysicist goes to the movies. Uh, so basically mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're, you're covering some movies and you're talking about the way science is portrayed in these movies. And some get them very right and some get them very wrong. And you're, you're going to be covering that. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Tyson, but you are a bit of a Trekkie. Is that correct? So well, first call me Neil. Okay. Oh, okay, and sure. Second, yeah. I, I, there are Trekkies out there and I don't want to... I don't want to usurp, I, I don't want to claim more than what I am. Okay. I'm, I'm a bigger fan of Star Trek than of Star Wars. That's how, the, you know, the kingdom divides. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And yeah. so, so I see Star Wars and I know what they're trying to do, but if you want to compare the two, there, there's no contest with regard to attention given to known science and creativity given to imagined science for the future. So in that regard, I lean Star Trek. Well, I, I have a saying, because I'm, I'm a Trekkie. I'm not, like, I'm not crazy, like, stalking William Shatner Trekkie, but I do love Star Trek, and my saying is, Star Wars is fantasy. Star Trek is reality. That's what, <laughs> that's what I always say to a, a Jedi who tries to confront me, you know, about <laughs> Star Wars, Star Trek. I say, okay, whatever. You know, basically, we all have smartphones. That's basically a tricorder, right? And we're just, I don't know, how far away do you think we are from actually transporting a living organism like they do in Star Trek? I, I'd say a decade. So I think the, the actual solution to that is not what was imagined for Star Trek. Because they're, you know, we're talking about the transporter, right? And right, they right. convert you to a beam of energy and then recollect you on the other side. I think that exact challenge can be met by opening up wormholes between any two points and you just step through. Then you're never dematerialized and then brought back to life. It's you the entire time. So uh, I, I, I foresee wormhole travel before I see tr uh, transporter travel. Okay. Do you think any of the uh, the big three rocket guys, as I like to call them now, uh, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or Richard Branson or... Uh, the, the Billionaire's Boys Club? Yes, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think there, we know the physics of wormholes, but the engineering of it seems a bit out of reach at this point, and it may be impossibly out of reach, but for me, it, it's not any more out of reach than dematerializing you and then recreating you on the other side. But by the way, once you're dematerialized, why not make six copies of you? I mean, <laughs> oh. I don't know if there's any episode of Star Trek, Star Trek that addressed that, but once we know all the information contained within you, and then you can rebuild that information, I can make as many copies of you as I want at that point. So that's an interesting hmm. uh, yeah. uh, concern, I think, that has never been addressed. Well, not, At least not a Okay. I can see making six copies of Neil deGrasse Tyson because I think personally the world would be a better place for that. But six <laughs> copies of me, I don't know. My wife might have something to say. Like, uh, there's one is enough of you, Mike. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know. So uh, yeah. and, and when you're at the Hanover Theater on Tuesday, uh, you're not just going to be covering science fiction movies. You're going to be covering uh, a, a very diverse uh, collection of movies, right? You're not sticking to science fiction. Correct. In fact, only a few of them will be science, literal science fiction films. I think the movie Gravity, I, I give a shout out to uh, also uh, War of the Worlds. Mm. And although uh, well, that's all happening on Earth rather than in space, but it involves, you know, invaders from Mars. Uh, I also give a shout out to The Martian and to the movie Contact. But that's, so that's fine. Those are science fiction movies. You expect that a scientifically literate person would have something to say about that. So we're there, and so I give you that. But there are other movies that you just might not have thought of that has interesting science in them. For example, Frozen. Mm, <laughs> yes. You know, I don't think people go to Frozen to, to, to come out saying, gee, I was scientifically enlightened by that. <laughs> but I found things in it and other movies that you would not suspect that had elements of science that I said, hey... They put a lot of thought into this. And since it's completely animated, there's no accidental display of something. Everything is done on purpose. 
you know, right down to every frame that appears. And so, so I, I would say most of what I'll be presenting are movies that are not really about science, but there's something interesting scientific that happens in them that's worth noting. Mm. And so this is when I offer a comment. But, uh, by the way, there's a yeah. quote from Mark Twain, which, because people say, I'm never inviting you to see a movie with me because you'll just, <laughs> right. you know, you'll be crabby the whole time. <laughs> and, and it's like, no, no, I'm silent. Okay. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know who's, who's crabby the whole time? Are people who read the book first. Oh, they yeah. They're never happy. Oh, you know, yeah. They're Leave them at home with their book, okay? You can take me to the movies. I'll be, I'll be on my best behavior. And here's what I give you. I quote Mark Twain. Okay. First get your facts straight, then distort them at your leisure. Ah, yes. That is how I want to look at it, right? So I'll, just, I'll give an example. In Star Wars The Force Awakens, in fact, this, what I'm about to describe to you is not in this talk. Okay. Uh, I've created a, an astrophysicist goes to the movies. The sequel, <laughs> it's in that one. <laughs> so if, if Hanover invites me, the Hanover Theater invites me back next year, we can do the sequel to it. Okay. But in it, just as an example, in Star Wars: The Force Awakens, Episode Seven, the I think it was Episode Seven, the the new Death Star has extra energy powers. You know, and it's endowed by extra. So, so what they do, it parks next to a star and sucks out all the energy of the star. And then it uses that energy to destroy planets. So that's a badass Death Star compared to the original, right? Which would only be able to destroy one planet, right, with all of its energy. So, so okay, all right. But holding aside the fact that if you took all the energy in a star and put it in you, you would be a star. Okay, just hold that aside. Let's assume that special containment vessels to put it in. Do you realize how much energy is actually in the star? Clearly, no one in Star Wars did this calculation. Because had they, they realized they could destroy 10,000 planets, not just eight or, or five or whatever it was that was so diabolical about the new powers that the Death Star could now wield. So this is an example of where knowing the science could have enhanced the plot line because so often you hear producers, creators, set designers, no, we, we're going to ignore the science because... I have this story I need to tell, and it's going to constrain me. No, no. no. The universe is more interesting, more diverse. It is more mind-blowing than probably anything you're going to think up, you know, uh, you know in, in your sketches mm -hmm. for the scene that you're imagining. So that's an example. So these are the kind of things I point out. Where, places where science could have enhanced the plot, places where science, you didn't care about it, but... The fact that you went there, I'll give you a shout out for that. I'll give you a hall pass. <laughs> if, you <didn't, laughs> if you didn't get it right, but you went there and you didn't right. have to go there, right. I'll give it to you. Like, uh, here's another. Here's another example. This is uh, in the sequel again. So I'm giving you stuff that's not even in. so in the movie L.A. Story. Yes, uh, Steve Steve Martin, a charming rom com. Okay, yeah. completely charming. In the old days, as time would pass, you would see a calendar on the wall, and you'd see the pages flip on the calendar where the clock would go quickly mm -hmm. just to show that the time has elapsed. Well, in this, they don't use those two devices. They use the phase of the moon. The moon shows up in the beginning, middle, and end, and its phase is changing throughout the show. You don't, you don't have to pay attention to that, because you, so what? But I paid attention to it, and I know exactly now how much time has passed. Is it a week? Is it two weeks? Is it a month? I see the phase of the moon, and they thought about it. So that is good. Yeah. The problem is they grow the moon, the phases of the moon, in the wrong direction. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> they could have called, you know, the Griffith Observatory. They're in L.A. Right, right. There's right. astronomers there, <laughs> you know. And so I'm, I'm torn in that case because i got to give them credit for going there. But the fact that they got it wrong and it was an easily correctable thing, so I'll give them a B. Okay. Oh, <laughs> oh. Are you going to be grading these movies? No. On, oh, okay. I, I, All right. That's so petty to do that. I should, <laughs> and maybe one day I will, but I'm not that petty yet. Okay. All right. Well, let, mm -hmm. let, let me ask you this, though, in, in regards to, to, I guess, what this whole show is about. Is it the movie industry's responsibility 
to get those facts straight and to teach people about science. Because you said, you know, this would enhance the story. But, you know, kind of like what Mark Twain said in like that old saying, uh, why let facts get in the way of a good story? Is it their responsibility to do, to do that? No. No, I don't ever want to constrain artists. They should do whatever they want. But I'll tell you this. Suppose we're watching the movie Titanic, mm-hmm. right? And Leonardo DiCaprio comes, the movie just begins, and he shows up. We see him for the first time, and he's wearing tie-dyed bell-bottom jeans. Okay? No, tie-dyed shirt and bell-bottom jeans. You say, yeah. that's wrong. <laughs> no. This is 1912, all right? There was no tie-dyed, or, you know. No. The sailors maybe had bell-bottoms, but not ordinary people. So you would cry foul. And you would say, that took me out of the moment, because you're trying to create an era for me to live in while I ingest your story. And so you would fault the costume designer for that. Yeah. That costume designer would get fired, probably, or rather would not work again for making that kind of a mistake. In a more, that's a stupid example, of course. Let me give a more subtle, interesting example. Let's say there's a Jane Austen period piece mm-hmm. when, did, when we heard novels early 1800s or so. So a carriage drives up to the, you know, the country estate, and the people get out, and they're wearing derbies instead of top hats. Okay, uh, yes. yeah. I, I wouldn't know the difference, but if let's say you study history, you say, no, the, the, top, the, the derby was not in style over that period. And if you know that, it takes you out of the moment. So, so why, and, and here's another example, we've all experienced this for sure, uh, because we all know there's some car enthusiast in our lives that we would call our friend. We've, you watch a movie, again, a period piece. Let's say it takes place in 1962. No, let's say it takes like 1958, and there's a 1962 Chevy Bel Air parked in the street. They'll say, no, mm-hmm. the car didn't exist yet. Right, <laughs> right, right. right. And you say, wow, that's cool. You know that. These people with this knowledge get our respect, and they get our admiration for not only being that perceptive, but having the knowledge to comment in that way. All I'm asking is that I get no less respect than others who are doing exactly the same thing with other aspects of the film. Right. So the more scientifically literate the public is, the less the producers can get away with not paying attention mm. to science that they could have. Mm. And so, so the pressure on them will be from the public more than just for me just describing what they did right or wrong. Right. So, so they can do whatever they want, really. But we have a growing community of geeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, woo! Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a and, and what's my evidence of this? Just visit any Comic-Con. Right. The New York one, the San Diego <laughs> one, of course, is the original big one. And New York might be bigger than they are now, but San Diego has the deep roots. Right. And, you know, tens of thousands of people yeah oh my gosh and what's funny is what's interesting to me is they all love fantasy they're all carrying around their lightsabers but at the end of the day they know the difference between science fiction and science fact and they're scientifically literate and they're using that literacy to then enjoy the stories that are being told they're the ones that are going to call you out if you could have gotten something right and didn't and so ultimately perhaps science and films will achieve the the expectations will rise to the expectations of the viewer the way a costume designer does, a set designer, a... You know, look at the TV series Mad Men. There was a huge investment yeah. in time, energy, props, mm-hmm. so that that took place in 1961 and 62 and 63. And, and the, the comments that they made, that, which were current news at the time, but it's only showing, showing up in the show, Oh, my gosh. Watching that, you go back to other shows, you say, man, they just messed up in these other shows. They didn't even (laughs) do their homework. Right. Do the homework. Go look at magazines of the day and see how people dressed. Look at what was written and see how people spoke. Look at the attitudes they had. Look at all the situations that people smoked. People smoked in elevators. Oh, yeah. And in movie theaters. And they just did this in the show. And you look at it and say, oh, my gosh. Right, (laughs) yeah. So... So it's praised for that. Why not offer the same praise for people who get the science right? That's my only point. I'm sorry it took me so many no. paragraphs to communicate that to you. 
No, I, I fully, I, I have a better understanding of, of why you're doing this. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a music geek, so I went to see, you know, the uh, Freddie Mercury movie, Bohemian Rhapsody. And through the whole film, I'm like, well, that didn't come out then. No, no, they're playing this song too early. And my wife finally turned to me and said, shut up. I'm just trying to enjoy the movie. So, yeah, I, underst- I fully understand now why, you know, you're doing this and, and, you know, you take it from a car person's point of view or a historian's point of view. So I completely understand. Or for costume designer. And in your case, by the way, what I would do is cut him slack if the way they use the song, because songs are about ideas and themes and love and hate and, mm-hmm. and, and emotion. So maybe they needed it in the moment for the part of the story they're telling. So they had to play a little loosey goosey with the timeline. Mm-hmm. That's where you give them a Mark, Mark Twainian hall pass. Right. Um, with the get your facts straight, then distort them. But uh, if it's just blind ignorance, yeah, there's no excuse for that. Well, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time. Uh, Hanover Theater here in Worcester next Tuesday, an astrophysicist goes to the movies. I'm very much looking forward to this. One final question since we're, so, uh, we're in the season now. Will you be covering any holiday movies or Christmas movies? Oh, you know, wow. Hmm. You know, something about Santa and how he gets those reindeer to fly or you know, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, I was just thinking. I don't know. You know, just tis the season. All right, you know, uh, let, me, let me think about it. I have a week? Yeah. Let me think, <laughs> let me think about that. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, there are, Sa- you know, the Santa Claus, you know, yeah. C-L-A-U-S-E. That yeah. has some fun, interesting parts to it. Uh, but what, what happens if it's, if it's fun and it works? I'd, I'd leave it, you know, that's not, I comment on science you don't expect to be there, that they happen to get right, mm-hmm. and science that you expect to be there, but they happen to get wrong. If it's otherwise just fun storytelling, I don't, I usually leave the movie alone. Right, In, right. in this, in the context of this, this uh, retelling. But, uh, I mean, if, if reindeer can fly, what do they need legs for, you know? <laughs> that fly. is an amazing <laughs> question. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh boy. Maybe we should just leave that alone. Here, you know, just, what you just 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 leave that alone because we don't want to ruin <laughs> Christmas for anybody. <laughs> All right. Well, oh, uh, I got one for you. you ready? Yeah, yeah. So they always show. Here's one I could do. I got it. I'll find some movie clip where you go to the North Pole and you see Santa in his workshop, and usually there's like mountains and trees and things in the way. And then I just remind people, there's no land on the North Pole. Right, it's all ice. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's, well, ice for now. Well, that's right? True. right, yeah, for now, unfortunately. Yeah. And in the future, Santa's going to be in a, you know, in a bathing suit. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's going to be like Costner in Waterworld. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. Exactly. All right, well, uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, thank you so much for taking the time. It was a real pleasure talking with you, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the you and the and the movies you cover uh, next Tuesday, Hanover Theater here in Worcester. Thank you so much, Excellent. sir. Thanks for having me.